Hello and welcome to Alta Live. I'm so happy you could be here. Um, we are here today to talk to Tim Shields about the desert tortoises and some of the challenges that they're facing. Uh, my name is Matt Haber. I'm Alta's newsletter editor. And I worked on a piece by Anise Gross, a journalist in San Francisco, with Tim. So I'm excited to talk to him and learn more about his uh, work with the tortoises. But first, I would like to do a little housekeeping. Um, Alta Live is a weekly chat show for Alta Journal, which just came out with its desert issue, which Tim is a centerpiece of. And you can subscribe to Alta for as little as $3 digital per month, or you can get our print and become a member of our community. So we're going to send you links after this to help get you to sign up and become a member of Alta. And uh, usually we start this off by asking you to put into the Q&A where you're uh, watching us from today. I am in Oakland waiting for this atmospheric river to pour down on me. Um, Tim is in a much more beautiful place. You want to tell us where you are? Well, I'm I'm actually under beautiful overcast here in the Mojave Desert in Joshua Tree, where I live while I'm doing the raven and tortoise work. But Fantastic. I'm really enjoying today is there's promise of rain tomorrow and and we never resent rain out here in the Mojave. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So please put your questions in there in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of this. But to start off, let me uh, kind of set up Tim. We, we have this piece about him by Anise that talks about the decades that you've spent defending tortoises against various challenges. Um, many of them man-made, many of them bird. Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, what you do and then we'll talk about it. Sounds great. Uh, I had a 35 year career studying desert tortoises in detail as part of a crew for, of uh, Dr. Christine Berry, who's a famous tortoise conservationist. And in the course of that work, we monitored population changes across the Mojave Desert and we recorded about a 95% decline in their numbers over time. We also studied in detail why that was happening. There are a huge number of causes. One of them that was clear was raven predation on juvenile tortoises. Raven numbers have exploded. And I sort of, about 10, 12 years ago, I decided I wanted to shift out of merely documenting the decline to doing something about it and went looking for tools that could be applicable. And I identified the Raven threat as the one that was manageable, meaning there were tools potentially that could help solve it and was an existential threat to tortoises. So that sort of has become my focus and some would say my obsession of late. So just describing one species, the Raven as an existential threat to another, the desert tortoise, Sounds kind of like you have a little anger or resentment to those ravens, do you? No, not at all. I Ravens are fascinating. I just spent a couple of days, three days, uh, trapping ravens and putting radios on them. And it was up close and personal. I got bitten by them. I got the stink eye from them. And they I know you by no, now, right? They're really no smart. ill will. No ill will to ravens. Yeah. They, and they, uh, they can remember people, right? They're going to come back for you. They know me. And they don't like me and yeah. and with reason i don't i don't resent them for not liking me but uh it's really they are the 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 incredible numbers of ravens in the mojave desert uh, i'll give you one example there's a roost that we have studied and done nightly counts at and we had a count of 6500 one time 6500 ravens wow it was like uh alfred hitchcock couldn't right. have dreamed of anything more What's a group of ravens called? Do they have a name? Yes, I love this. A conspiracy of ravens. Nice. <laughs> and they are very conspiratorial yeah. and paranoid and interesting, hyper intelligent, and they're dinosaurs. I mean, that was the experience of handling them up close. As I looked at them, it's just like feathered dinosaurs. Their feet are just, they just look like dinosaur feet. They're really cool, super intelligent. And now, like the, you know, one of the things that's really exciting me is that we have these 20 ra radios on these ravens. They're they're basically positional trackers, GPS transmitters, and they are drawing maps for us of wow. their movements through the Mojave Desert. And this is going to be um, it's going to give us an insight into their movement through human 
mediated spaces that is unprecedented. It's really cool. The map. Yeah, tell me about that that yeah. other relationship with the other species, which is us. You were telling so, me before we started this kind of a three way yeah. relationship here. The, it's a triangular relationship between ravens, tortoises, and human beings. So, and and the contrast between tortoises and the other two species are profound. Tortoises are very conservative, behaviorally conservative animals. That doesn't mean they're dumb. They're actually incredibly tuned to their environment and I would say intelligent, but they are cautious wilderness creatures. They evolved in the wilderness. It's what they're tuned to. And then you have the transformer human beings. We transform landscapes on a on an unimaginable scale and completely unprecedented in the history of our planet that one species alters its environment for its own purposes to the degree we do and then you've got the opportunist ravens say thank you very much mm -hmm. for spreading water all over the place for building all these structures that we nest in for running over wildlife on your roads so that we can eat the remains on and on. You also mentioned uh, something about sewage that the ravens seem to like very much. Yeah, I'm working at a at a sewage treatment plant right now, and this is maybe the most extreme from a from an aesthetic point of view. <laughs> the most extreme example of ravens taking advantage of their relationship with humans is that um, at sewage treatment plants, the fats, oils, and grease that come into the plant float on the surface of these pools you're being decorous that come in from our toilets correct it's yeah. a, it's from us it's yeah. through us it's, it's all it's, of our crap it's the cream cheese and the and the margarine and on and on uh ravens in this they, case they know good eats when they see them they do know good eats and they and they appreciate pure fat you got to understand a any animal, but particularly a desert animal, really wants fat. They don't really care about meat as much as fat. Fat is energy. And in the case of a bird, a bird's egg is, is a glob of fat. Is this, and, a, this is a, what kind of bird is this? Well, this is, I'm getting ahead. I'm mixing. Okay. This is a 3D printed replica of a raven's egg. And so that's a glob of fat. Well, if you're going to start out so them, small and cute and then they turn so big and scary. Um, sidebar. <laughs> and, and one reason I'm really impressed with ravens is that something that size, that's an actual size replica of a raven's egg. In six weeks, the thing that hatches out of this is going to be the size of an adult raven because when they leave the nest, they're full size. That's incredible. But in order to feed this thing up to the size of a bird that's close to the size of a red-tailed hawk, um, wow. you got it. They have to eat everything, and in in the course of trying to raise young out of this egg that are flight worthy in six to eight weeks, they end up preying on lots of desert tortoises. This yeah, is so actually, tell me what happened here. This is broken open, and yeah, this is a this is a a desert an actual desert tortoise shell. And you can see the top seems relatively undamaged, but you flip it over okay. and the soft belly. It, exactly. There's a soft spot right in the middle, essentially like a fontanelle on a baby's mm. head. And the ravens know that weak point. So they, in many cases, they'll flip the tortoise over, hammer them with their beaks. And having handled those, those ravens last week, I now understand the power of those birds. The beak is sharp. And the the thrust of the beak is very powerful. They bust open the baby tortoise and they don't go necessarily for the meat. What they're trying to get is the liver and the other fatty organs. And so that's what they go after when they're preying on a on a desert tortoise. But whether or not whatever they're eating of that carcass for the case of the desert tortoise in many places, uh, ravens are at such a density that the odds of a juvenile tortoise surviving from roughly this size, this is a replica, this is one of our 3D printed ones, but that's pretty much the size of a hatchling tortoise. And to get to this size, which is even 
nominally survivable, uh, Raven attack survivable, takes, you know, eight eight years in the best of con conditions, 15 at, in in many cases. So this they weren't preyed upon, how long would a tortoise live? They're just oh, they live. I'm convinced they live a century. We haven't been watching them long enough to know that, but uh, I'm, you know, certainly 80 years, and and a century is certainly not out of out of the realm of possibility. Very long lived animals, very conservative, very careful, and then you then you introduce this hyper intelligent predator at unprecedented in unprecedented numbers. And the odds of your little tortoise surviving to adulthood drop to zero. That's the conservation crisis is that there's no more in many areas. There's no more recruitment simply because this animal has to expose itself to the risk of predation in order to grow to the point mm -hmm. that it's resistant to predation. Yeah. It's a catch 22 that's that's wiping them out. So tell us some of the things that you've created that your company has made to kind of level the playing field between the tortoises and the ravens you've invented yep. a lot of cool stuff you're like um, q in the james bond films but just for tortoises yes um the q in this case and this is a this is a point i really want to stress i'm one person i'm not particularly adept technologically so hard shell the company that i founded with a lot of talented people is much more than me. I'm sort of the face of the company and I'm responsible for a, a number, a fair number of the ideas that drive the company. But in terms of execution, it's like there's there are dozens of people that are making this thing work. So I don't want to give the impression that it's like- but Yeah, all know, credit to the tinkerers behind the scenes. Correct. The tinkerers, yeah. the business guys, the, the lawyers, the- PR people, all of that. There's, there's like a, it's a company, but um, what, what I started doing was thinking, what pot, what tools are out there that could have an effect on ravens? And the first thing I thought of, being a an aviation geek, was, <laughs> was actually radio controlled airplanes. I didn't know anything about AKA drones. AKA drone. Correct. Well, now drones. Yeah. Um, I started thinking radio controlled airplanes to scare ravens. It didn't seem feasible. And then I got put onto drones and I started working with a, with a guy called Roy Haggard, who's a, a drone genius. Um, and so we, we started using drones in lots of ways uh, for direct frightening of ravens, but also for um, a, a technique we've developed again with partner firms called remote egg oiling. And that's basically birth control for ravens mediated by uh, devices mounted on aerial drones. But an example of sort of the process that we go through in flying these drones up into tight and crazy kind of circumstances in very close proximity to hazards, we killed a number of drones and I decided we needed a cage around the okay. rotors. So this, it's typical of kind of what we do is like we start with a problem, we attack it, we see the limitations of the existing technology. So you have to evolve adapt. just as the Correct. animals evolve. Yeah. Right. And this thing, like it's it it has allowed us, it allows us to get very close to so the just target. to be clear, you're using this to kind of scare them or to, as you said, do oil the eggs so that they get right. the membrane gets too thin for the babies to come out. You're not well, fighting the birds with those. No, no, yeah. but, but we'll, we'll fly up to a nest full of these spray a thin layer of oil on them. They then um, we've rendered the egg non-viable at that point. Um, but the adults keep taking care of the, of the now deceased eggs and they don't hatch and so it's a it's direct birth control but and you would say i think in the article you would said that they tell each other the birds will say like this is yeah. not a safe place anymore well, these are not good to eat anymore uh they communicate they don't they not, communicate yeah. and they also watch each other mm -hmm. and so that's the i think that's really the the secret is that they they watch each other in the case of egg oiling at the end of the 
nesting season, they do a thing called nest prospecting. They take a tour of the neighborhood. Okay, I didn't have any babies. How did everybody else? Nobody had any babies. This is a bad place. And, you know, ideally they abandon those places. And we, we are starting to document abandonment of entire areas due to our activities, which is great because if we can convince them to go away, then we don't have to do the work anymore. Mm -hmm. We might have to reinforce it. But another example of a of a major push of ours is how do you create a replica desert tortoise? And this is where 3D printing comes in. Our genius, our 3D printing and engineering genius is Frank Garcio. And he and I have worked, and with Bill Borman, who's an expert in raven tortoise interactions, he's part of the team. Uh, We've worked to perfect fake baby tortoises. So that's made out of what material? This is 3D printed plastic filament. Okay. It, I mean, it um, looks so real. They're very good. These are really good copies. Yeah. And we want to fool an expert, which is the Raven. Yeah. But we have now weaponized these devices. There is a, a chemical. And this is just like this pattern repeats over and over again. We find that there's a chemical called methylanthranolate, which is fake grape juice. It's artificial grape flavoring. For some reason, birds are extraordinarily sensitive to this. Mammals and reptiles so it's are not, not a poison. It's not a chemical. It's not a poison. It's yeah. an irritant. Yeah. And so we have- Which I think is important to note that you're not trying to, you're not no. an exterminator. No, not at all. Because, you know, my my attitude is that an uh a raven that we educate, that Hardshell educates, is more valuable than a dead raven. If we can rewire the the circuitry of living ravens, mm -hmm. they will they will propagate the message. You're kind of using their intelligence correct. against themselves. They're they're it's, partners um, in their own. Yeah, it's yeah. in. We're using them. It's sort of like uh, disinformation. It's not disinformation, but it's information. Yeah, you're running a propaganda campaign to them through through a social network. They have a social network. Theirs is is mediated with body language and voice and probably signals we don't even understand, but news gets around. And so the idea here, when you weaponize it and and the weaponized version has a chamber underneath that's buried under the under the model, but and, and I, you can go to our website, hardshelllabs.com and, and see some videos of these things in action, but it's very cool. We work with a company called CRG uh, on the technology end. And this thing is tuned to be sensitive to the tap of a raven's beak or an attempt by a raven uh -huh. to upend the thing, boom in the face. Oh my God, what is that? Fly away in fear. And maybe next time around, um, think twice about preying on a desert tortoise. And I don't think you told us what that's called, that device. Oh, we call it a techno tort. Right. Uh, nice. I, wish, I love that name. I didn't I didn't make up the name. Uh, an early collaborator called yeah. it a techno tort. And it just has stuck because no, it's got a real pleasing sound to it. It does. It, it unless you're a raven, then you're not so happy. Unless you're a raven, then you're not happy. And then, you know, a, a major tool for us is lasers. This is one. This is a handheld laser uh, made by Frank Gersio. And I'm going to actually just yeah. try to tell me if you can see that. I dot. can see a little, a little green moving yeah. dot. Yep. So and so every animal is scurrying away. The, it's almost mystically perfect, the sensitivity of ravens to lasers. It's just like it was. Yeah, it's tell a me gift. about that. It's a gift. They're extremely laser sensitive. And so we have configured lasers in a dozen different ways to repel ravens and so then you start with the raven problem then you realize it's adaptable to other species of birds and now we're investigating how can you use different colors of lasers on different species of birds and so you generalize your solution and and then refine it so that it is inexpensive to use and now we're we're approaching this um, situation where we have enough experience with these devices and we've made them inexpensive enough mm -hmm. that mar the commercial markets are opening to us. We started just with a conservation 
goal. So is there a hope that you would get these to homeowners and people who have properties in the Mojave and they could do it themselves in their own property? Potentially. Uh, we're also working with utilities that have a, a severe problem with ravens and other birds building nests on their infrastructure that then catch fire, that then can cause ca catastrophic yeah. wildfires. Well, we didn't start with any solving any of those, like, like saving human lives. We're on right. the verge of having a solution that's going to save human lives. It's tremendously exciting. Yeah, I actually, I, I snuck a peek at the Q&A um, and I got one question that actually is relevant to this mm -hmm. from Martine who asks, are the ravens native to the desert or are they invasive like us? There's a new term called native invasive, uh -huh. which is kind of split. Yes, the they are native to the area, but they are functionally invasive in that their numbers have, uh, have skyrocketed and their distribution through the desert has skyrocketed. So it's it's easy to think about this. Think about um, how dry the uh, natural chunk of desert is and how many opportunities there are for water just in a suburban area. We, I've, I'm looking at a hose bib right now. We water our, our plants here at the house. Um, a clever raven takes advantage. And so we've made water just widely available in areas mm -hmm. that would have been bone dry previously. So that has, and then you've got sewage treatment plants and roadkill and all the rest. You end up with, with massive numbers of ravens that are unprecedented in history. So functionally, they are invaders. Mm -hmm. Numerically, they're invasive. Technically, they're native animals, but but this is not a it's not a natural situation. So aside from employing some of these technologies, what can humans do to be supportive of the tortoises and other animals that are under attack. You were talking um, about your own plants, your own water. What can yeah. we do in our own yards to be good defenders? You can be aware of, are you providing subsidies for ravens? There's a, there's a limit to what you can do. I have had numbers of people ask about lasers and you can drive them away from areas with, with Any small particular lasers. color. That was one of the questions we got. Green is very effective on ravens. Okay. It's ineffective on other species. Um, and then any just, wattage for laser? That's another, someone asked that question. Very specific. I would go with a, something under 250 milliwatts just for safety's sake and really under 100 milliwatts. And don't point them at your little sister. That's no, not a toy. No. It's like, they aren't toys. They are not toys. And this is not frivolous. It's like, I don't want people going out and buying five watt lasers yeah. to zap ravens because people will get hurt. And we've, we have a spotless safety record with these things because we are super careful. We're cognizant of, of the, the hazard associated with laser light. That's part of like our business model is that we need fairly powerful lasers, but we have to use them in a way that doesn't get people hurt. Yeah. Otherwise our business dries up. So, um, so don't fiddle around with it, be careful with it, but they do work and they will work sort of, uh, sunset late, late hours. Uh, you can zap them and you don't need to do it for very long. They'll and when learn. you say zap them, you don't mean zap at the animal. You mean no. like their area you where show they're hanging them, out. Show yeah. them the beam. They'll fly yeah. away. We don't, we rarely have to actually hit a bird with the beam. They yeah. get it. And they pick it up really quickly and they learn, which is an advantage of working with a hyper-intelligent species. So um, there's that. There's also uh, like for desert tortoises, don't take a, a, a wild desert tortoise into captivity, leave them alone. Uh, if you see one on a road, take it off a road, particularly a heavily traveled road. Don't leave it there to get smashed. But but minimize your interaction with it other than watching them. They're incredible yeah. creatures. I mean, we've been talking about ravens. Tortoises are really, oh my God, they're so, they're so cool and they're so different from us. They're careful. They understand the, how their environment cares for them. They don't overburden their environment, unlike certain species I could mention. Mm -hmm. That are uh, on this call, perhaps. Yes. And so <laughs> that's overall, it's like, um, become a better citizen of planet Earth, lighten your load, lighten the load you put on on the system that is keeping us all alive. 
And actually I towards wanted... that end, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, one of the questions we had about was about ATV riding in the desert and if that's a, a, a big problem with the tortoises, but other animals as well and what people can do to kind of. Yeah, I'm I'm hearing them. A, a couple of them just whiz by the yard yeah. here. Um, and action. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's like that's that's not really being a very good citizen if you're yeah. ripping around and and damaging soil and all of that so there there are some obvious ways you know reduce your use of fossil fuels the, i'm you know celebrating this cloud cover because we've just been through two years of horrific drought on the tail end of 20 years of drought more severe than it has been seen in the mojave desert in 1200 years wow. so we're talking millennial level drought um so and i think it, one of the takeaways from that article that anise wrote was that you actually think in thousands of year blocks when you I think do. about the tortoises yeah. and i think that's a kind of an amazing way to think about this and well this this is a 250 million year old piece of sculpture that has been tuned and refined by evolution over a vast stretch of time and i can't I can't look at a structure like that and not be amazed and humbled by it. Um, we're very young as a as a species, and this whole thing of technology. And I also realize, you know, I come on as sort of a a big cheerleader for technology. Da da da. It's it's Pandora's box we're opening, and it's indicative of how badly we've managed our time on Earth that we have to resort. To these technological fixes and using all this crit like drones and laser like in in an ideal situation we wouldn't need these tools but i've come to the point after a 45 year career in in tortoise biology and conservation that we i don't see an alternative to applying these tools as rapidly and as widely as possible so i i am aware of the um the conflicts between solving a problem and then creating more problems sure. we, we've been we have a real track record of creating more problems as we try to solve them so um i'm not unaware of the irony yeah well that's a great place for us to end tim i mean i'm so grateful for the work you do and also just for explaining it to us um we've gotten so many questions i'm going to see if there's one last one that i can pull up here sure I wish we could keep talking because I, I, I do too. I can go really on fun. about this stuff forever. Um, I guess, is there any positive incursions that humans have made into the desert? One person asked us about to the tortoises that have used their water on their property and their shade. Are we making some things better for them by being there? Or should we just leave them alone? We can't leave them alone. If we leave yeah. them alone, they're going to go out. So yeah. um, we, we've got to intervene. It's sad that we have to intervene. Um, I'm I'm working right now. One one effort I have is uh, a citizen science based raven nest reporting uh, effort, and so I'm I'm going to try to create and and we didn't get into this, but hard shell is also we're going to attempt to create online games that are conservation actions using remotely controlled devices and exploiting the natural playfulness of human beings and getting many more screen based like we're interacting through yeah. the screen um you know how do you how do you use that pool of human consciousness for good so that's something we're moving toward um when that comes online then lots of people are going to be able to help uh, but in the meantime be gentle to this planet oh my god look how lucky we are look at what a miracle life is look at how rare life is in the universe look around you and give thanks for life just life in general including ravens for that matter right it's all miraculous and we just need to bring a, an appreciation of the miracle to our journey on the planet what That's a good right. way to start our Finish year it. by having the sentiment. Thank you, Tim. Really. Happy seriously. New Year's. Many more to us and and many more to all the critters that are stuck on this 
miraculous sphere with us. We're going to keep fighting for him. We're going to keep fighting Absolutely. for him. Absolutely. So it's thank you, everybody. Give up. So thank we may you. as well just. We're not going to give up. It's way more entertaining to, to be in the fight. Agreed. Thank and you thanks all for to coming Alta today. Journal. Thanks to Alta <laughs> Journal for helping tell the story. And thanks to you, Matt, for a great interview. And Anise, who did, Anise Gross, who did and the story Anise about Tim. We're going to link to that in the yep. email. And we're going to put up this interview on our website, altaonline.com this week, uh, today rather. Yep. And next week, we're going to stick with our desert theme. Our managing editor, Blaze Zarega, is going to interview Ken Lane about the Desert Oracle and other desert. Oh, Ken happening. Lane is great. He is so, great. <laughs> well, you got to tune in, Tim. We get 1230 next week. Ken Mon Lane's on Wednesday. Yes. All right. So I think that is it for us now. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. And uh, let's fight for all the animals and for the desert. Namaste, y'all. <laughs>